Let's start with the easiest one and work our way upwards, just like a video game. It's genre theory. It's got a death curse! Let's say you have a screwdriver. Yes, yeah, screwdriver. No, not that kind, the drink. A simple screwdriver is one part vodka, two parts orange juice. Now a lot of people think that's pretty generous with the vodka, so how about one quarter vodka and three quarters orange juice? Is that still a screwdriver? And what if you don't like vodka that much, but you do like orange juice? And you dilute it to one eighth vodka and seven eighths orange juice? At any point does it stop being a screwdriver and start being just a glass of orange juice with a splash of vodka for good measure? These questions are at the heart of genre studies, an interdisciplinary branch of critical theory that overlaps several different academic fields, including art, linguistics, film studies, and rhetoric. Genre theory is primarily concerned with categorizing certain types of things, and then examining what one might expect to find within those categories. This is incredibly important for both creators, especially in a capitalist system where stories are required to make money, and for audiences who need that comfortable familiarity in order to safely consume a text. That's why if you're making a musical biopic and the events of Freddie Mercury's life don't fit neatly into the narrative, it's the life events that have to change, not the conventions of the narrative. I've got it. Got what? AIDS. The audience has certain expectations based on the category of the film they're consuming. The horror genre, for example, is easy enough to categorize. It's a set of narratives specifically intended to provoke feelings of unease, disgust, or fear in its audience. The line between horror and, say, romantic comedy is easy enough to draw, and it's a pretty thick line. The horror genre is intended to stir the emotion of fear, while romantic comedies evoke joy. When we encounter the rare attempt to cross-pollinate the two, like Twilight, My Boyfriend's Back, or Warm Bodies, we can ask ourselves, does the director want me to feel fear or warmth and content? Whatever our answer is goes a long way toward figuring out which genre it belongs to. The line becomes much hazier when we start talking about subgenres. Friday the 13th is part of a slasher subgenre, a group of movies that focuses on a killer who engages in stalk and kill scenarios with a series of victims. Alien is a sci fi horror film about an alien that engages in stalk and kill scenarios with a series of victims. Yet very few people would consider Alien a slasher film, even with the similar themes. When deciding on genre and subgenre, that's where fandoms start to engage in discourse, sometimes passionately. To avoid all that, let's just stipulate that Friday the 13th is a slasher series and move on with our lives. While its big daddy, the horror genre, can be traced all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome, its baby, the slasher genre, is a much more recent invention. Tales of misanthropic glee killers can be found as far back as Cain and Abel, but most critics would trace the origins of the slasher genre back to the Grand Guignol Theatre, situated in the Pigalle district of Paris. The Guignol operated from 1897 until 1962. Regardless of director, the Guignol specialized in lurid tales of revenge, like The Revenge of Dupont Langui, Leo Marchais' The Man of the Night, and André Lord's The Horrible Passion, in which a nanny strangles the children in her care. Suffice it to say, the Guignol was popular with the seedier elements of Paris. They told stories of prostitutes and vagrants and the criminally insane. It's kind of like the ID channel of the early 20th century. One of the common themes in Guignol was the fear of the other. Immigrants, poor people, diseases. At the other end of the class spectrum, literary works about serial killers were becoming quite common. The fascination with London West End's Jack the Ripper and the burgeoning field of psychoanalysis gave authors volumes worth of inspiration. A new generation of primarily female authors began focusing on whodunits as a mystery subgenre. Perhaps most relevant to the birth of the slasher film is Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who released a mystery novel titled The Circular Staircase. In the story, Rachel Innes, along with her niece and nephew, rent a house in the country for the summer. Little do they know, the house belonged to a thief who had hidden money in the walls. Now they must deal with all manner of unsavory characters trying to get to the money. The Circular Staircase would be adapted as The Bat for the stage, and later for the screen. And it's this incarnation that would become the basis for the old dark house subgenre. More importantly for our purposes, the film is the most recognizable antecedent to the modern slasher film.
Reinhardt was not alone in the genre, of course. John Willard's The Cat and the Canary and J.B. Priestley's The Old Dark House both made use of an isolated group of people stalked by a madman. But perhaps no one was more influential on the genre than Agatha Christie. Christie's 1939 novel Ten Little Indians centered on a group of strangers invited to an island only to be picked off one by one until the killer revealed their motives. You are cordially invited to cocktail and murder. In many cases, the mystery was as much a why done it as a who done it. The Stella thriller would continue in various incarnations until 1960. That's when Alfred Hitchcock released his genre-breaking film, Psycho. Psycho set several conventions for the genre that survive to this day. For one thing, Hitchcock changed moviegoing by instructing theater owners not to let people in after the movie had started. Even Hitchcock's marketing campaign for the film attempted to merge the high art of the Academy with the lurid train wreck that was Grand Guignol. This young man, you had to feel sorry for him. After all, being dominated by an almost maniacal woman was enough to drive anyone to the extreme of, uh, uh, well, let's go in. With Psycho's success came scores of imitators, from William Castle's Homicidal and Straightjacket to many of the Italian giallo films. And of course, you can draw a direct line from Psycho to what many consider the originators of the slasher genre, Black Christmas and Halloween. expanded his act. Could that be one person? No, Claire, that's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir doing their annual obscene phone call. The genre would arguably hit its peak in the 1980s in terms of visibility and financial, if not artistic, success. Wikipedia records 165 slasher films produced during the 1980s, and those are just the ones that are notable enough to receive Wikipedia pages. Friday the 13th perfectly occupied that genre codifier spot by adopting and solidifying genre conventions. The film is essentially Agatha Christie's Ten Little Indians in a New Jersey forest rather than an isolated island. Even the you never could have guessed this reveal at the end is similar. What Cunningham and writer Victor Miller added was an attractive young cast to capitalize on the sex appeal and a return to the lowbrow bloodbaths of the Grand Guignol. The franchise would continue in a strict conventional way through three more films until competition from supernatural horror films like A Nightmare on Elm Street forced them out of their comfort zone. Ironically, it was this experimentation with narrative that drove away existing fans and failed to attract converts. This is what Coca-Cola discovered in 1985 when they replaced their classic formula with New Coke, a product that tasted more like their rival Pepsi. And now, with this, the best Coke you've ever had, it really sets you apart. What Coke discovered is that their consumers wanted their Pepsi thirst quenched by Pepsi and their Coke thirst satisfied by Coke. In the same vein, Friday the 13th's efforts to make Jason more supernatural alienated fans of the comparatively more grounded original film. The boy. Is he dead too? The series would peter out not with a bang but a whimper, as Jason Takes Manhattan took in less money than any of its predecessors, less than half of what the original installment brought in, and it angered fans to the point where it effectively killed the franchise. And this is where genre theory comes in handy. While the genre's conventions were enough to make producers very rich in the short term, the lack of imagination and strict adherence to formula also means creative stagnation. And it wasn't long until the audience got out in front of the creators and the genre became something of a running joke. This is what genre scholars refer to as the generic cycle. A struggle between convention and invention that all creators face. For the slasher genre, the generic cycle seems to run 15 to 18 years. Psycho was released 15 years after Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. Halloween was released 18 years after Psycho. And Wes Craven's postmodern deconstruction of the genre Scream was released 18 years after Halloween. If you want to extend that even further, Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard's meta slasher Cabin in the Woods was released in 2012, 16 years after Scream. She's got so much heart. You think of all the pain and the 
Tequila is my lady! The state of the genre as of 2019 seems to be in another creative lull. While the last decade has seen Cabin in the Woods, The Final Girls, and Detention receive varying degrees of success, the glut of Stephen King adaptations, Blumhouse Jump Scare Fests, and Art House Horror doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the classic slasher, unless it's something that panders to Gen Xers anxious to cannibalize their own nostalgia. But we'll talk about that another time. Oh, we'll get to you, Gen Xers. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this, I've linked to more stuff you might be interested in. Cool Channel Vidcast features me talking about a number of pop culture topics, and I also occasionally appear on the Deconstruction Workers podcast, a group of brilliant scholars discussing popular culture using their theory and wisdom. It's a hoot and a holler, so give it a listen.